Chapter thirty eight of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two weeks later, I stood on the deck of Lucio's yacht, the Flame, a vessel whose complete magnificence filled me, as well as all other beholders, with bewildered wonderment and admiration. She was a miracle of speed, her motive power being electricity and the electric engines with which she was fitted were so complex and remarkable as to baffle all would-be inquirers into the secret of their mechanism and potency. A large crowd of spectators gathered to see her as she lay off Southampton, attracted by the beauty of her shape and appearance. Some bolder spirits even came out in tugs and rowboats, hoping to be allowed to make a visit of inspection on board, but the sailors, powerfully built men of a foreign and somewhat unpleasing type, soon intimated that the company of such inquisitive persons was undesirable and unwelcome. With white sails spread and a crimson flag flying from her mast, she weighed anchor at sunset on the afternoon of the day her owner and I joined her, and moving through the waters with delicious noiselessness and incredible rapidity, soon left far behind her the English shore, looking like a white line in the mist, or the pale vision of a land that might once have been. I had done a few quixotic things before departing from my native country. For example, I had made a free gift of his former home, Willowsmere, to Lord Elton, taking a sort of sullen pleasure in thinking that he, the spendthrift nobleman, owed the restoration of his property to me, to me, who had never been either a successful linen draper or a furniture man, but simply an author, one of those sort of people, whom my lord and my lady imagine they can patronize and neglect again at pleasure, without danger to themselves. The arrogant fools invariably forget what lasting vengeance can be taken for an unmerited slight by the owner of a brilliant pen. I was glad, too, in a way, to realize that the daughter of the American railway king would be brought to the grand old house to air her countessship, and look at her prettily pert little physiognomy in the very mirror where Sibyl had watched herself die. I do not know why this idea pleased me, for I bore no grudge against Diana Chesney. She was vulgar but harmless, and would probably make a much more popular chatelaine at Willowsmere Court than my wife had ever been. Among other things, I dismissed my man Morris and made him miserable, with the gift of a thousand pounds, to marry and start a business on. He was miserable because he could not make up his mind what business to adopt, his anxiety being to choose the calling that would pay best, and also because though he had his eye upon several young women, he could not tell which among them would be likely to be least extravagant, and the most serviceable as a cook and housekeeper. The love of money and the pains of taking care of it embittered his days as it embitters the days of most men, and my unexpected munificence towards him burdened him with such a weight of trouble as robbed him of natural sleep and appetite. I cared nothing for his perplexities, however, and gave him no advice, good or bad, my other servants I dismissed, each with a considerable gift of money, not that I particularly wished to benefit them, but simply because I desired them to speak well of me. And in this world it is very evident that the only way to get a good opinion is to pay for it. I gave orders to a famous Italian sculptor for Sibyl's monument, English sculptors having no conception of sculpture. It was to be of exquisite design, wrought in purest white marble, the chief adornment being the center figure of an angel ready for flight, with the face of Sibyl faithfully copied from her picture, because, however devilish a woman may be in her lifetime, one is bound by all the laws of social hypocrisy to make an angel of her as soon as she is dead. Just before I left London, I heard that my old college friend, Buffles, John Carrington, had met with a sudden end. Busy at the retorting of his gold, 
he had been choked by the mercurial fumes and had died in hideous torment at one time this news would have deeply affected me but now i was scarcely sorry i had heard nothing of him since i had come into my fortune he had never even written to congratulate me always full of my own self-importance i judged this as a great neglect on his part and now that he was dead i felt no more than any of us feel nowadays at the loss of friends and that is very little we have really no time to be sorry so many people are always dying and we are in such a desperate hurry to rush on to death ourselves nothing seemed to touch me that did not closely concern my own personal interest and i had no affections left unless i may call the vague tenderness i had for mavis clare an affection yet to be honest this very emotion was after all nothing but a desire to be consoled pitied and loved by her to be able to turn upon the world and say this woman whom you have lifted on your shield of honour and crowned with laurels she loves me she is not yours but mine purely interested and purely selfish was the longing and it deserved no other name than selfishness my feelings for rimenez too began at this time to undergo a curious change the fascination i had for him the power he exercised over me remained as great as ever but i found myself often absorbed in a close study of him strangely against my own will sometimes his every look seemed fraught with meaning his every gesture suggestive of an almost terrific authority he was always to me the most attractive of beings nevertheless there was an uneasy sensation of doubt and fear growing up in my mind regarding him a painful anxiety to know more about him than he had ever told me and on rare occasions i experienced a sudden shock of inexplicable repulsion against him which like a tremendous wave threw me back with violence upon myself and left me half stunned with a dread of i knew not what alone with him as it were on the wide sea cut off for a time from all other intercourse than that which we shared together these sensations were very strong upon me i began to note many things which i had been too blind or too absorbed in my own pursuits to observe before the offensive presence of emile who acted as chief steward on board the yacht filled me now not only with dislike but nervous apprehension the dark and more or less repulsive visages of the crew haunted me in my dreams and one day leaning over the vessel's edge and gazing blankly down into the fathomless water below i fell to thinking of strange sorceries of the east and stories of magicians who by the exercise of unlawful science did so make victims of men and delude them that their wills were entirely perverted and no longer their own i do not know why this passing thought should have suddenly overwhelmed me with deep depression but when i looked up to me the sky had grown dark and the face of one of the sailors who was near me polishing the brass handrail seemed singularly threatening and sinister i moved to go to the other side of the deck when a hand was gently laid on my shoulder from behind and turning i met the sad and splendid eyes of lucio are you growing weary of the voyage geoffrey he asked weary of those two suggestions of eternity the interminable sky the interminable sea i am afraid you are man easily gets fatigued with his own littleness and powerlessness when he is set afloat on a plank between air and ocean yet we are travelling as swiftly as electricity will bear us and as worked in this vessel it is carrying us at a far greater speed than you perhaps realize or imagine i made no immediate answer but taking his arm strolled slowly up and down i felt he was looking at me but i avoided meeting his gaze you have been thinking of your wife he queried softly and as i thought sympathetically i have shunned for reasons you know of all allusion to the tragic end of so beautiful a creature beauty is 
alas, so often subject to hysteria. Yet, if you had any faith, you would believe she is an angel now. I stopped short at this and looked straight at him. There was a fine smile on his delicate mouth. An angel? I repeated slowly. Or a devil? Which would you say she is? You, who sometimes declare that you believe in heaven and hell. He was silent, but the dreamy smile remained still on his lips. Come, speak, I said roughly. You can be frank with me. You know, angel or devil, which? My dear Geoffrey, he remonstrated gently and with gravity, a woman is always an angel, both here and hereafter. I laughed bitterly. If that is part of your faith, I am sorry for you. I have not spoken of my faith, he rejoined in colder accents lifting his brilliant eyes to the darkening heaven. I am not a salvationist, that I should bray forth a creed to the sound of trump and drum. All the same you have a creed, I persisted, and I fancy it must be a strange one. If you remember, you promised to explain it to me. Are you ready to receive such an explanation? he asked in a somewhat ironical tone. No, my dear friend, permit me to say you are not ready, not yet. My beliefs are too positive to be brought even into contact with your contradictions, too frightfully real to submit to your doubts for a moment. You would at once begin to revert to the puny, used-up old arguments of Voltaire, Schopenhauer, and Huxley, little atomic theories like grains of dust in the whirlwind of my knowledge. I can tell you I believe in God as a very actual and positive being, and that is presumably the first of the church articles. You believe in God? I echoed his words, staring at him stupidly. He seemed in earnest. In fact, he had always seemed in earnest on the subject of deity. Vaguely, I thought of a woman in society whom I slightly knew, an ugly woman, unattractive and mean-minded, who passed her time in entertaining semi-royalties and pushing herself among them. She had said to me one day, I hate people who believe in God, don't you? The idea of a God makes me sick. You believe in God? I repeated again, dubiously. Look, he said, raising his eyes toward the sky. There a few drifting clouds cover millions of worlds impenetrable, mysterious, yet actual. Down there, and he pointed to the sea, lurk a thousand things of which, though the ocean is a part of earth, human beings have not yet learned the nature. Between these upper and lower spaces of the incomprehensible, yet absolute, you, a finite atom of limited capabilities, stand, uncertain how long the frail thread of your life shall last yet arrogantly balancing the question with your own poor brain as to whether you, you, in your utter littleness and incompetency, shall condescend to accept a god or not? I confess that of all the astounding things in the universe, this particular attitude of modern mankind is the most astonishing to me. Your own attitude is... The reluctant acceptance of such terrific knowledge as is forced upon me, he replied with a dark smile. I do not say I have been an apt or a willing pupil. I have had to suffer in learning what I know. Do you believe in hell? I asked him suddenly. And in Satan, the arch enemy of mankind? He was silent for so long that I was surprised, the more so as he grew pale to the lips and a curious, almost death-like rigidity of feature gave his expression something of the ghastly and terrible. After a pause, he turned his eyes upon me. An intense burning misery was reflected in them, though he smiled. Most assuredly I believe in hell. How can I do otherwise if I believe in heaven? If there is an up, there must be a down. If there is light, there must also be darkness. And concerning the arch-enemy of mankind? If half the stories reported of him be true, he must be the most piteous and pitiable figure in the universe. 
what would be the sorrows of a thousand million worlds compared to the sorrows of satan sorrows i echoed he is supposed to rejoice in the working of evil neither angel nor devil can do that he said slowly to rejoice in the working of evil is a temporary mania which affects man only for actual joy to come out of evil chaos must come again and god must extinguish himself he stared across the dark sea the sun had sunk and one faint star twinkled through the clouds and so i again say the sorrows of satan sorrows immeasurable as eternity itself imagine them to be shut out of heaven to hear all through the unending eons the far-off voices of angels whom once he knew and loved to be a wanderer among deserts of darkness and to pine for the light celestial that was formerly as air and food to his being and to know that man's folly man's utter selfishness man's cruelty keep him thus exiled an outcast from pardon and peace man's nobleness may lift the lost spirit almost within reach of his lost joys but man's vileness drags him down again easy was the torture of sisyphus compared with the torture of satan no wonder that he loathes mankind small blame to him if he seeks to destroy the puny tribe eternally little marvel that he grudges them their share of immortality think of it as a legend merely and he turned upon me with a movement that was almost fierce christ redeemed man and by his teaching showed how it was possible for man to redeem the devil i do not understand you i said feebly awed by the strange pain and passion of his tone do you not yet my meaning is scarcely obscure if men were true to their immortal instincts and to the god that made them if they were generous honest fearless faithful reverent unselfish if women were pure brave tender and loving can you not imagine that in the strong force and fairness of such a world lucifer son of the morning would be moved to love instead of hate that the closed doors of paradise would be unbarred and that he lifted towards his creator on the prayers of pure lives would wear again his angel's crown can you not realize this even by way of a legendary story why yes as a legendary story the idea is beautiful i admitted and to me as i told you once before quite new still as men are never likely to be honest or women pure i'm afraid the poor devil stands a bad chance of ever getting redeemed i fear so too and he eyed me with a curious derision i very much fear so and his chances being so slight i rather respect him for being the arch enemy of such a worthless race he paused a moment then added i wonder how we have managed to get on such an absurd subject of conversation it is dull and uninteresting as all spiritual themes invariably are my object in bringing you out on this voyage is not to indulge in psychological argument but to make you forget your troubles as much as possible and enjoy the present while it lasts there was a vibration of compassionate kindness in his voice which at once moved me to an acute sense of self-pity the worst enervator of moral force that exists i sighed heavily truly i have suffered i said more than most men more even than most millionaires deserve to suffer declared lucio with that inevitable touch of sarcasm which distinguished some of his friendliest remarks money is supposed to make amends to a man for everything and even the wealthy wife of a certain irish patriot has not found it incompatible with affection to hold her money-bags close to herself while her husband has been declared a bankrupt how she has idolized him let others say now considering your cash abundance it must be owned the fates have treated you somewhat unkindly the smile that was half cruel and half sweet radiated in his eyes as he spoke and again a singular revulsion of feeling against him moved me to dislike and fear and yet how fascinating was his company 
I could not but admit that the voyage with him to Alexandria, on board the flame, was one of positive enchantment and luxury all the way. There was nothing in a material sense left to wish for. All that could appeal to the intelligence or the imagination had been thought of on board this wonderful yacht, which sped like a fairy ship over the sea. Some of the sailors were skilled musicians, and on tranquil nights, or at sunset, would bring stringed instruments, and discourse to our ears the most dulcet and ravishing melodies. Lucio himself, too, would often sing, his luscious voice resounding, as it seemed, over all the visible sea and sky, with such passion as might have drawn an angel down to listen. Gradually my mind became impregnated with these snatches of mournful, fierce, or weird minor tunes and I began to suffer in silence from an inexplicable depression and foreboding sense of misery, as well as from another terrible feeling, to which I could scarcely give a name, a dreadful uncertainty of myself, as of one lost in a wilderness and about to die. I endured these fits of mental agony alone, and in such dreary burning moments believed I was going mad. I grew more and more sullen and taciturn, and when we at last arrived at Alexandria I was not moved to any particular pleasure. The place was new to me, but I was not conscious of novelty. Everything seemed flat, dull, and totally uninteresting. A heavy, almost lethargic stupor chained my wits, and when we left the yacht in harbour and went on to Cairo, I was not sensible of any personal enjoyment in the journey, or interest in what I saw. I was only partially roused when we took possession of a luxurious dahabeah, which, with a retinue of attendants, had been specially chartered for us, and commenced our lotus-like voyage up the Nile. The reed-edged, sluggish yellow river fascinated me. I used to spend long hours reclining at full length in a deck-chair, gazing at the flat shores and blown sand-heaps, the broken columns and mutilated temples of the dead kingdoms of the past. One evening, thus musing, while the great golden moon climbed languidly up into the sky to stare at the wrecks of earthly ages, I said, If one could only see these ancient cities as they once existed, what strange revelations might be made! Our modern marvels of civilization and progress might seem small trifles after all, for I believe in our days we are only rediscovering what the peoples of old time knew. Lucio drew his cigar from his mouth and looked at it meditatively. Then he glanced up at me with a half smile. Would you like to see a city resuscitated? he inquired. Here, in this very spot, some six thousand years ago, a king reigned, with a woman not his queen, but his favorite, quite a lawful arrangement in those days, who was as famous for her beauty and virtue as this river is for its fructifying tide. Here civilization had progressed enormously, with the one exception that it had not outgrown faith. Modern France and England have beaten the ancients in their scorn of God and creed their contempt for divine things, their unnameable lasciviousness and blasphemy. This city, and he waved his hand towards a dreary stretch of shore where a cluster of tall reeds waved above the monster fragment of a fallen column, was governed by the strong, pure faith of its people more than anything, and the ruler of social things in it was a woman. The king's favorite was something like Mavis Clare in that she possessed genius, she had also the qualities of justice, intelligence, love, truth, and a most noble unselfishness. She made this place happy. It was a paradise on earth while she lived. When she died, its glory ended. So much can a woman do if she chooses. So much she does not do, in her usual cow-like way of living. How do you know all this you tell me of? I asked him. By study of past records he replied. I read what modern men declare they have no time to read. You are right in the idea that all new things are only old things reinvented or rediscovered. 
if you had gone a step further and said that some of men's present lives are only the continuation of their past you would not have been wrong now if you like i can by my science show you the city that stood here long ago the city beautiful as its name is translated from the ancient tongue i roused myself from my lounging attitude and looked at him amazedly he met my gaze unmoved you can show it to me i exclaimed how can you do such an impossible thing permit me to hypnotize you he answered smiling my system of hypnotism is very fortunately not yet discovered by meddlesome inquirers into occult matters but it never fails of its effect and i promise you you shall under my influence see not only the place but the people my curiosity was strongly excited and i became more eager to try the suggested experiment than i cared to openly show i laughed however with affected indifference i am perfectly willing i said all the same i don't think you can hypnotize me i have much too strong a will of my own at which remark i saw a smile dark and saturnine hover on his lips but you can make the attempt he rose at once and signed to one of our egyptian servants stop the dahabeya azima he said we will rest here for the night azima a superb-looking eastern in picturesque white garments put his hands to his head in submission and retired to give the order in another few moments the dahabeya had stopped a great silence was around us the moonlight fell like yellow wine on the deck in the far distance across the stretches of dark sand a solitary column towered so clear-cut against the sky that it was almost possible to discern upon it the outline of a monstrous face lucio stood still confronting me saying nothing but looking me steadily through and through with those wonderful mystic melancholy eyes that seemed to penetrate and burn my very flesh i was attracted as a bird might be by the basilisk eyes of a snake yet i tried to smile and say something indifferent my efforts were useless personal consciousness was slipping from me fast the sky the water and the moon whirled round each other in a giddy chase for precedence i could not move for my limbs seemed fastened to my chair with weights of iron and i was for a few minutes absolutely powerless then suddenly my vision cleared as i thought my senses grew vigorous and alert i heard the sound of solemn marching music and there there in the full radiance of the moon with a thousand lights gleaming forth from high cupolas shone the city beautiful end of chapter 38「Chapter thirty nine of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A vision of majestic buildings, vast, stately, and gigantic, of streets crowded with men and women in white and coloured garments adorned with jewels, of flowers that grew on the roofs of palaces and swung from terrace to terrace in loops and garlands of fantastic bloom of trees broad branched and fully leafed of marble embankments overlooking the river of lotus lilies growing thickly below by the water's edge of music that echoed in silver and brazen twangings from the shelter of shady gardens and covered balconies every beautiful detail rose before me more distinctly than an ivory carving mounted on an ebony shield just opposite where i stood or seemed to stand on the deck of a vessel in the busy harbour a wide avenue extended opening up into the huge squares embellished with strange figures of granite gods and animals i saw the sparkling spray of many fountains in the moonlight and heard the low persistent hum of the restless human multitudes that thronged the place as thickly as bees clustered in a hive to the left of the scene I could discern a huge bronze gate guarded by sphinxes. There was a garden beyond it, and from that depth of shade a girl's voice, singing a strange wild melody, 
came floating towards me on the breeze. Meanwhile, the marching music I had first of all caught the echo of sounded nearer and nearer, and presently I perceived a great crowd approaching with lighted torches and garlands of flowers. Soon I saw a band of priests in brilliant robes that literally blazed with sun-like gems. They were moving towards the river, and with them came young boys and little children, while on either side maidens, white-veiled and rose-wreathed, paced demurely, swinging silver censers to and fro. After the priestly procession walked a regal figure between ranks of slaves and attendants. I knew it for the king of this city beautiful, and was almost moved to join in the thundering acclamations which greeted his progress and that snowy palanquin, carried by lily-crowned girls, that followed his train. Who occupied it? What gem of his land was thus tenderly enshrined? I was consumed by an extraordinary longing to know this. I watched the white burden coming nearer to my point of vantage. I saw the priests arrange themselves in a semicircle on the river embankment, the king in their midst, and the surging, shouting multitude around. Then came the brazen clangor of many bells, intermixed with the rolling of drums and the shrilling sound of reed pipes lightly blown upon. And, amid the blaze of the flaring torches, the white palanquin was set down upon the ground. A woman, clad in some silvery, glistening tissue, stepped forth from it like a sylph from the foam of the sea. But, she was veiled, I could not discern so much as the outline of her features, and the keen disappointment of this was a positive torture to me. If I could but see her, I thought, I should know something I had never hitherto guessed. Lift, oh, lift the shrouding veil, spirit of the city beautiful, I inwardly prayed, for I feel I shall read in your eyes the secret of happiness. But the veil was not withdrawn. The music made barbaric clamors in my ears. The blaze of strong light and color blinded me, and I felt myself reeling into a dark chaos, where, as I imagined, I chased the moon as she flew before me on silver wings. Then the sound of a rich baritone trolling out a light song from a familiar modern opera buffet confused and startled me, and in another second I found myself staring wildly at Lucio, who, lying easily back in his deck-chair, was caroling joyously to the silent night and the blank expanse of sandy shore, in front of which our dahabea rested motionless. With a cry I flung myself upon him. "'Where is she?' I exclaimed. "'Who is she?' He looked at me without replying, and smiling quizzically, released himself from my sudden grasp. I drew back, shuddering and bewildered. I saw it all, I murmured, the city, the priests, the people, the king, all but her face. Why was that hidden from me? And actual tears rose to my eyes involuntarily. Lucio surveyed me with evident amusement. What a find you would be to a first-class spiritual impostor, playing his tricks in cultured and easily gulled London society, he observed. You seem most powerfully impressed by a passing vision. Do you mean to tell me, I said earnestly, that what I saw just now was the mere thought of your brain conveyed to mine? Precisely, he responded. I know what the city beautiful was like, and I was able to draw it for you on the canvas of my memory and present it as a complete picture to your inward sight. For you have an inward sight, though, like most people, you live unconscious of that neglected faculty. "'But who was she?' I repeated obstinately. "'She was, I presume, the king's favourite. "'If she kept her face hidden from you as you complain, I am sorry. "'But I assure you it was not my fault. "'Get to bed, Geoffrey. You look dazed. "'You take visions badly, yet they are better than realities, believe me.' "'Somehow I could not answer him. "'I left abruptly and went below to try and sleep.' but my thoughts were all cruelly confused, and I began to be more than ever overwhelmed with a sense of deepening terror, a feeling that I was being commanded, controlled, and, as it were, 
driven along by a force that had in it something unearthly. It was a most distressing sensation. It made me shrink at times from the look of Lucio's eyes. Now and then, indeed, I almost cowered before him, so increasingly great was the indefinable dread I had of his presence. It was not so much the strange vision of the city beautiful that had inspired this in me, for after all that was only a trick of hypnotism, as he had said, and as I was content to argue it with myself, but it was his whole manner that suddenly began to impress me as it had never impressed me before. If any change was slowly taking place in my sentiments towards him, so surely it seemed was he changing equally towards me. His imperious ways were more imperial, his sarcasm more sarcastic, his contempt for mankind more openly displayed and more frequently pronounced. Yet I admired him as much as ever. I delighted in his conversation, whether it were witty, philosophical, or cynical. I could not imagine myself without his company. Nevertheless, the gloom on my mind deepened. Our Nile trip became infinitely wearisome to me, so much so that almost before we had got halfway on our journey up the river, I longed to turn back again and wished the voyage at an end. An incident that occurred at Luxor was more than sufficient to strengthen this desire. We had stayed there for several days exploring the district and visiting the ruins of Thebes and Karnak, where they were busy excavating tombs. One afternoon they brought to light a red granite sarcophagus intact. In it was a richly painted coffin, which was opened in our presence, and was found to contain the elaborately adorned mummy of a woman. Lucio proved himself an apt reader of hieroglyphs, and he translated in brief and with glib accuracy the history of the corpse as it was pictured inside the sepulchral shell. A dancer at the court of Queen Amenartes, he announced for the benefit of several interested spectators who, with myself, stood round the sarcophagus, who, because of her many sins and secret guilt which made her life unbearable and her days full of corruption, died of poison administered by her own hand, according to the king's command, and in presence of the executioners of law. Such is the lady's story, condensed. There are a good many other details, of course. She appears to have been only in her twentieth year. Well, and he smiled as he looked round upon his little audience, we may congratulate ourselves on having progressed since the days of these over-strict ancient Egyptians. The sins of dancers are not with us, taken au grand seru. Shall we see what she is like? No objection was raised by the authorities concerned in the discoveries, and I, who had never witnessed the unrolling of a mummy before, watched the process with great interest and curiosity. As one by one of the scented wrappings were removed, a long tress of nut-brown hair became visible. Then, those who were engaged in the task used more extreme and delicate precaution, Lucio himself assisting them to uncover the face. As this was done, a kind of sick horror stole over me. Brown and stiff as parchment though the features were, their contour was recognizable and when the whole countenance was exposed to view, I could almost have shrieked aloud the name of Sybil, for it was like her, dreadfully alike, and as the faint half-aromatic, half-putrid odors of the unrolled cerements crept towards me on the air, I reeled back giddily and covered my eyes. Irresistibly, I was reminded of the subtle French perfume exhaled from Sybil's garments when I found her dead. That, and this sickly effluvia were similar. A man standing near me saw me swerve as though about to fall, and caught me on his arm. "'The sun is too strong for you, I fear,' he said kindly. "'This climate does not suit everybody.' I forced a smile and murmured something about a passing touch of vertigo. Then, recovering myself, I gazed fearfully at Lucio, who was studying the mummy attentively with a curious smile. Presently stooping over the coffin, he took out of it 
a piece of finely wrought gold in the shape of a medallion. This, I imagine, must be the fair dancer's portrait, he said, holding it up to the view of all the eager and exclaiming spectators. Quite a treasure trove, an admirable piece of ancient workmanship, besides being the picture of a very lovely woman. Do you not think so, Geoffrey? He handed me the medallion, and I examined it with deadly and fascinated interest. The face was exquisitely beautiful, but assuredly it was the face of Sybil. I never remember how I lived through the rest of that day. At night, as soon as I had an opportunity of speaking to Rimenez alone, I asked him, Did you see? Did you not recognize? That the dead Egyptian dancer resembled your late wife? he quietly continued. Yes, I noticed it at once. But that should not affect you. History repeats itself. Why should not lovely women repeat themselves? Beauty always has its double somewhere, either in the past or future. I said no more, but next morning I was very ill, so ill that I could not rise from my bed, and passed the hours in restless moaning and irritable pain that was not so much physical as mental. There was a physician resident at the hotel at Luxor, and Lucio, always showing himself particularly considerate for my personal comfort, sent for him at once. He felt my pulse, shook his head, and after much dubious pondering, advised my leaving Egypt immediately. I heard his mandate given with a joy I could scarcely conceal. The yearning I had to get away from this land of the old gods was intense and feverish. I loathed the vast and awful desert silences where the sphinx frowns contempt on the puny littleness of mankind, where the opened tombs and coffins expose once more to the light of day faces that are the very semblance of those we ourselves have known and loved in our time, and where painted history tells us of just such things as our modern newspapers chronicle, albeit in different form. Rimenez was ready and willing to carry out the doctor's orders, and arranged our return to Cairo, and from thence to Alexandria, with such expedition as left me nothing to desire, and filled me with gratitude for his apparent sympathy. In as short a time as abundance of cash could make possible, we had rejoined the flame, and were en route, as I thought, for France or England. We had not absolutely settled our destination, having some idea of coasting along the Riviera. But my old confidence in Rimenez, being now almost restored, I left this to him for decision, sufficiently satisfied in myself that I had not been destined to leave my bones in terror-haunted Egypt. And it was not till I had been about a week or ten days on board, and had made good progress in the recovery of my health, that the beginning of the end of this never-to-be-forgotten voyage was foreshadowed to me in such terrific fashion as nearly plunged me into the darkness of death. Or rather, let me now say, having learned my bitter lesson thoroughly, into the fell brilliancy of that life beyond the tomb which we refuse to recognize or realize till we are whirled into its glorious or awful vortex. One evening, after a bright day of swift and enjoyable sailing over a smooth and sunlit sea, I retired to rest in my cabin, feeling almost happy. My mind was perfectly tranquil. My trust in my friend Lucio was again re-established. And, I may add, so was my old, arrogant, and confident trust in myself. My access to fortune had not, so far, brought me either much joy or distinction, but it was not too late for me yet to pluck the golden apples of Hesperides. The various troubles I had endured, though of such recent occurrence, began to assume a blurred indistinctness in my mind, as of things long past and done with. I considered the strength of my financial position again with satisfaction, to the extent of contemplating a second marriage, and that marriage with Mavis Clare. No other woman should be my wife, I mentally swore. She, and she only, should be mine. I foresaw no difficulties in the way, and full of pleasant dreams and self-delusions, I settled myself in my berth, 
and dropped easily off to sleep. About midnight I awoke, vaguely terrified, to see the cabin full of a strong red light and fierce glare. My first dazed impression was that the yacht was on fire. The next instant I became paralyzed and dumb with horror. Sybil stood before me. Sybil, a wild, strange, tortured, writhing figure, half nude, waving beckoning arms, and making desperate gestures. Her face was as I had seen it last in death, livid and hideous. Her eyes blazed mingled menace, despair, and warning upon me. Round her, a living wreath of flame coiled upwards like a twisted snake. Her lips moved as though she strove to speak, but no sound came from them. And while I yet looked at her, she vanished. I must have lost consciousness then, for when I awoke it was broad day. But this ghastly visitation was only the first of many such, and at last, every night I saw her thus, sheeted in flame, till I grew well-nigh mad with fear and misery. My torment was indescribable, yet I said nothing to Lucio, who watched me, as I imagined, narrowly. I took sleeping draughts in the hope to procure unbroken rest, but in vain. Always I woke at one particular moment, and always I had to face this fiery phantom of my dead wife, with despair in her eyes and an unuttered warning on her lips. This was not all. One day, in the full sunlight of a quiet afternoon, I entered the saloon of the yacht alone and started back amazed to see my old friend, John Carrington, seated at the table, pen in hand, casting up accounts. He bent over his papers closely. His face was furrowed and very pale. But so lifelike was he, so seemingly substantial, that I called him by name. Whereat he looked up, smiled drearily, and was gone. Trembling in every limb, I realized that here was another spectral terror added to the burden of my days, and sitting down, I tried to rally my scattered forces and reason out what was best to be done. There was no doubt I was very ill. These phantoms were the warning of brain disease. I must endeavor, I thought, to keep myself well under control till I got to England. There I determined to consult the best physicians, and put myself under their care till I was thoroughly restored. Meanwhile, I muttered to myself, I will say nothing, not even to Lucio. He would only smile, and I should hate him. I broke off, wondering at this, for was it possible I should ever hate him? Surely not. That night, by way of a change, I slept in a hammock on deck hoping to dispel midnight illusions by resting in the open air. But my sufferings were only intensified. I woke as usual, to see not only Sybil, but also to my deadly fear the three phantoms that had appeared to me in my room in London on the evening of Viscount Linton's suicide. There they were, the same, the very same, only this time, all their livid faces were lifted and turned towards me, and though their lips never moved, the word, Misery, seemed uttered, for I heard it tolling like a funeral bell on the air and across the sea. And Sybil, with her face of death in the coils of a silent flame, Sybil smiled at me, a smile of torture and remorse. God, I could endure it no longer. Leaping from my hammock, I ran toward the vessel's edge, one plunge into the cool waves. Ha! There stood Emil, with his impenetrable dark face and ferret eyes. Can I assist you, sir? He inquired deferentially. I stared at him, then burst into a laugh. Assist me? Why, no, you can do nothing. I want rest, and I cannot sleep here. The air is too close and sulphurous. The very stars are burning hot. I paused. He regarded me with his usual gravely derisive expression. I am going down to my cabin, I continued, trying to speak more calmly. I shall be alone there, perhaps. Again I laughed wildly and involuntarily, and staggered away from him down the deck stairs, afraid to look back, lest I should see those three figures of fate 
following me. Once safe in my cabin, I shut to the door violently, and in feverish haste seized my case of pistols. I took out one and loaded it. My heart was beating furiously. I kept my eyes fixed on the ground, lest they should encounter the dead eyes of Sybil. One click of the trigger, I whispered, and all is over. I shall be at peace, senseless, sightless, and painless. Horrors can no longer haunt me. I shall sleep. I raised the weapon steadily to my right temple, when suddenly my cabin door opened and Lucio looked in. Pardon me, he said, as he observed my attitude. I had no idea you were busy. I will go away. I would not disturb you for the world. His smile had something fiendish in its fine mockery. Moved with a quick revulsion of feeling, I turned the pistol downward and held its muzzle firmly against the table near me. "'You say that?' I exclaimed in acute anguish. "'You say it, seeing me thus? I thought you were my friend!' He looked full at me. His eyes grew large and luminous, with a splendor of scorn, passion, and sorrow intermingled. "'Did you?' And again the terrific smile lit up his pale features. "'You were mistaken. I am your enemy!' A dreadful silence followed. Something lurid and unearthly in his expression appalled me. I trembled and grew cold with fear. Mechanically I replaced the pistol in its case. Then I gazed up at him with a vacant wonder and wild piteousness, seeing that his dark and frowning figure seemed to increase in stature, towering above me like the gigantic shadow of a storm-cloud. My blood froze with an unnameable sickening terror. Then thick darkness veiled my sight, and I dropped down senseless. End of chapter 39「Chapter Forty of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thunder and wild tumult, the glare of lightning, the shattering roar of great waves leaping mountains high and hissing asunder in mid-air. To this fierce riot of savage elements let loose, in a whirling, boisterous dance of death, I woke at last with a convulsive shock. Staggering to my feet, I stood in the black obscurity of my cabin, trying to rally my scattered forces. The electric lamps were extinguished, and the lightning alone illumined the sepulchral darkness. Frantic shoutings echoed above me on deck, fiend-like yells that sounded now like triumph, now like despair, and again like menace. The yacht leapt to and fro like a hunted stag amid the furious billows, and every frightful crash of thunder threatened, as it seemed, to split her in twain. The wind howled like a devil in torment. It screamed and moaned and sobbed, as though endowed with a sentient body that suffered acutest agony. Anon it rushed downwards with an angry swoop as of wide flapping wings, and at each raging gust I thought the vessel must surely founder. Forgetting everything but immediate personal danger, I tried to open my door. It was locked outside. I was a prisoner. My indignation at this discovery exceeded every other feeling and beating with both hands on the wooden panels, I called, I shouted, I threatened, I swore, all in vain. Thrown down twice by the topsy-turvy lurching of the yacht, I still kept up a desperate hammering and calling, striving to raise my voice above the distracting pandemonium of noise that seemed to possess the ship from end to end, but all to no purpose. And finally, hoarse and exhausted, I stopped and leaned against the unyielding door to recover breath and strength. The storm appeared to be increasing in force and clamor. The lightning was well nigh incessant, and the clattering thunder followed each flash so instantaneously as to leave no doubt but that it was immediately above us. I listened and presently heard a frenzied cry, Breakers ahead! This was followed by peals of discordant laughter. Terrified, I strained my ears for every sound, and all at once someone spoke to me quite closely, 
as though the very darkness around me had found a tongue. Breakers ahead, throughout the world, storm and danger and doom, doom and death, but afterwards, life. A certain intonation in these words filled me with such frantic horror that I fell on my knees in abject misery, and almost prayed to the God I had, through all my life, disbelieved in and denied. But I was too mad with fear to find words. The dense blackness, the horrid uproar of the wind and sea, the infuriated and confused shouting, all this was to my mind as though hell itself had broken loose and I could only kneel dumbly and tremble. Suddenly a swirling sound, as of an approaching monstrous whirlwind, made itself heard above all the rest of the din. A sound that gradually resolved itself into a howling chorus of thousands of voices sweeping along on the gusty blast. Fierce cries were mingled with the jarring thunder, and I leapt erect as I caught the words of the clangorous shout. Ave Satanas! Ave! Rigidly upright, with limbs stiffening for sheer terror, I stood listening. The waves seemed to roar, Ave Satanas! The wind shrieked it to the thunder, the lightning rode it in a snaky line of fire on the darkness. Ave Satanas! My brain swam round and grew full to bursting. I was going mad, raving mad, surely! or why should I thus distinctly hear such unmeaning sounds as these? With a sudden excess of superhuman force, I threw the whole weight of my body against the door of my cabin in a delirious effort to break it open. It yielded slightly, and I prepared myself for another rush and similar attempt, when all at once it was flung widely back, admitting a stream of pale light, and Lucio, wrapped in heavy shrouding garments, confronted me. Follow me, Geoffrey Tempest, he said in low, clear tones. Your time has come. As he spoke, all self-possession deserted me. The terrors of the storm, and now the terror of his presence, overwhelmed my strength, and I stretched out my hands to him appealingly, unknowing what I did or said. For God's sake, I began wildly. He silenced me by an imperious gesture. Spare me your prayers, for God's sake, for your own sake, and for mine. Follow. He moved before me like a black phantom in the pale, strange light surrounding him, and I, dazzled, dazed, and terror-stricken, trod in his steps closely, moved, as it seemed, by some volition not my own, till I found myself alone with him in the saloon of the yacht with the waves hissing up against the windows like live snakes ready to sting. Trembling and scarcely able to stand, I sank on a chair. He turned round and looked at me for a moment, meditatively. Then he threw open one of the windows. A huge wave dashed in and scattered its bitter salt spray upon me where I sat. But I heeded nothing. My agonized looks were fixed on him. The being I had so long made the companion of my days, Raising his hand with a gesture of authority, he said, Back, ye devils of the sea and wind, ye which are not God's elements but my servants, the unrepenting souls of men, lost in the waves or whirled in the hurricane, whichever ye have made your destiny, get hence and cease your clamor. This hour is mine. Panic-stricken, I heard, aghast, I saw the great billows that had shouldered up in myriads against the vessel sink suddenly. The yelling wind dropped, silenced. The yacht glided along with a smooth, even motion, as though on a tranquil inland lake. And almost before I could realize it, the light of the full moon beamed forth brilliantly and fell in a broad stream across the floor of the saloon. But in the very cessation of the storm, the words, Ave Satanas! trembled, as it were, upwards to my ears from the underworld of the sea, and died away in distance like a parting echo of thunder. Then Lucio faced me with what a countenance of sublime and awful beauty. Do you know me now, man whom my millions of dross have made wretched, or do you need me to tell you who I am? 
My lips moved, but I could not speak. The dim and dreadful thought that was dawning on my mind seemed as yet too frenzied, too outside the boundaries of material sense for mortal utterance. "'Be dumb, be motionless, but hear and feel,' he continued. "'By the supreme power of God, for there is no other power in any world or any heaven, I control and command you at this moment, your own will being set aside for once as naught. I choose you as one out of millions to learn in this life the lesson that all must learn hereafter. Let every faculty of your intelligence be ready to receive that which I shall impart, and teach it to your fellow men, if you have a conscience as you have a soul. Again I strove to speak. He seemed so human, so much my friend still, though he had declared himself my enemy, and yet, what was that lambent radiance encircling his brows, that burning glory steadily deepening and flashing from his eyes? "'You are one of the world's fortunate men,' he went on, surveying me straightly and pitilessly. "'So at least this world judges you, because you can buy its good will. But the forces that govern all worlds do not judge you by such a standard. You cannot buy their good will.' not though all the churches should offer to sell at you. They regard you as you are, stripped soul naked, not as you seem. They behold in you a shameless egoist, persistently engaged in defacing their divine image of immortality. And for that sin there is no excuse and no escape but punishment. Whosoever prefers self to God, and in the arrogance of that self, presumes to doubt and deny God, invites another power to compass his destinies, the power of evil, made evil and kept evil by the disobedience and wickedness of man alone, that power whom mortals call Satan, Prince of Darkness, but whom once the angels knew as Lucifer, Prince of Light. He broke off, paused, and his flaming regard fell full upon me. Do you know me, now? I sat a rigid figure of fear, dumbly staring. Was this man, for he seemed man, mad, that he should thus hint at a thing too wild and terrible for speech? If you do not know me, if you do not feel in your convicted soul that you are aware of me, it is because you will not know. Thus do I come upon men, when they rejoice, in their willful self-blindness and vanity. Thus do I become their constant companion, humoring them in such vices as they best love. Thus do I take on the shape that pleases them, and fit myself to their humors. They make me what I am. They mold my very form to the fashion of their flitting time. Through all their changing and repeating eras, they have found strange names and titles for me, and their creeds and churches have made a monster of me, as though imagination could compass any worse monster than the devil in man. Frozen and mute I heard, the dead silence, and his resonant voice vibrating through it, seemed more terrific than the wildest storm. You, God's work, endowed as every conscious atom of his creation is endowed, with the infinite germ of immortality, you, absorbed in the gathering together of such perishable trash as you conceive good for yourself on this planet. You dare, in the puny reach of your mortal intelligence, to dispute and question the everlasting things invisible. You, by the Creator's will, are permitted to see the natural universe, but in mercy to you the veil is drawn across the supernatural, for such things as exist there would break your puny earth brain as a frail shell is broken by a passing wheel. And because you cannot see, you doubt. You doubt not only the surpassing love and wisdom that keeps you in ignorance till you shall be strong enough to bear full knowledge, but you doubt the very fact of such another universe itself. Arrogant fool, your hours are counted by supernatural time. Your days are compassed by supernatural law. Your every thought, word, deed, and look must go to make up the essence and shape of your being in supernatural life hereafter. And what you have been in your soul here, 
must and shall be the aspect of your soul there that law knows no changing the light about his face deepened he went on in clear accents that vibrated with the strangest music men make their own choice and form their own futures he said and never let them dare to say they are not free to choose from the uttermost reaches of high heaven the spirit of god descended to them as man from the uttermost depths of lowest hell i the spirit of rebellion come equally as man but the god in man was rejected and slain i the devil in man live on forever accepted and adored man's choice this is not god's or mine were this self-seeking human race once to reject me utterly i should exist no more as i am nor would they exist who are with me listen while i trace your career it is a copy of the lives of many men and judge how little the powers of heaven can have to do with you how much the powers of hell i shuddered involuntarily dimly i began to realize the awful nature of this unearthly interview you geoffrey tempest are a man in whom a thought of god was once implanted that subtle fire or note of music out of heaven called genius so great a gift is rarely bestowed on any mortal and woe betide him who having received it holds it as of mere personal value to be used for self and not for god divine laws moved you gently in the right path of study the path of suffering of disappointment of self-denial and poverty for only by these things is humanity made noble and trained in the ways of perfection through pain and enduring labor the soul is armed for battle and strengthened for conquest for it is more difficult to bear victory well than to endure many buffetings of war but you you resented heaven's good will towards you the valley of humiliation suited you not at all poverty maddened you starvation sickened you yet poverty is better than arrogant wealth and starvation is healthier than self-indulgence you could not wait your own troubles seemed to you enormous your own efforts laudable and marvellous the troubles and efforts of others were nothing to you you were ready to curse god and die compassionating yourself admiring yourself and none other with a heart full of bitterness and a mouth full of cursing you were eager to make quick havoc of both your genius and your soul for this cause your millions of money came and so did i standing now full height he confronted me his eyes were less brilliant but they reflected in their dark splendor a passionate scorn and sorrow oh fool in my very coming i warned you on the very day we met i told you i was not what i seemed god's elements crashed a menace when we made our compact of friendship and i when i saw the faint last struggle of the not quite torpid soul in you to resist and distrust me did i not urge you to let that better instinct have its way you jester with the supernatural you base scoffer at christ a thousand hints have been given you a thousand chances of doing such good as must have forced me to leave you as would have brought me a welcome respite from sorrow a moment's cessation of torture his brows contracted in a sombre frown he was silent a moment then he resumed now learn from me the weaving of the web you so willingly became entangled in your millions of money were mine the man that left you heir to them was a wretched miser evil to the soul's core by virtue of his own deeds he and his dross were mine and maddened by the sheer accumulation of world's wealth he slew himself in a fit of frenzy he lives again in a new and much more realistic phase of existence and knows the actual value of mankind's cash payments this you have yet to learn he advanced a step or two fixing his eyes more steadily upon me wealth is like genius bestowed not for personal gratification but for the benefit of those who lack it what have you done for your fellow-men 
the very book you wrote and launched upon the tide of bribery and corruption was published with the intention to secure applause for yourself not to give help or comfort to others your marriage was prompted by lust and ambition and in the fair sensuality you wedded you got your deserts no love was in the union it was sanctified by the blessing of fashion but not the blessing of god you have done without god so you think every act of your existence has been for the pleasure and advancement of yourself and this is why i have chosen you out to hear and see what few mortals ever hear or see till they have passed the dividing line between this life and the next i have chosen you because you are a type of the apparently respected and unblameable man you are not what the world calls a criminal you have murdered no one you have stolen no neighbor's goods your unchastities and adulteries are those of every fashionable vice-monger and your blasphemies against the divine are no worse than those of the most approved modern magazine contributors you are guilty nevertheless of the chief crime of the age sensual egotism the blackest sin known to either angels or devils because hopeless the murderer may repent and save a hundred lives to make up for the one he snatched the thief may atone with honest labor the adulterer may scourge his flesh and do grim penance for late pardon the blasphemer may retrieve his blasphemies but for the egoist there is no chance of wholesome penitence since to himself he is perfect and counts his creator as somewhat inferior this present time of the world breathes egotism the taint of self the hideous worship of money corrodes all life all thought all feeling for vulgar cash the fairest and noblest scenes of nature are wantonly destroyed without public protest the earth created in beauty is made hideous parents and children wives and husbands are ready to slay each other for a little gold heaven is barred out god is denied and destruction darkens over this planet known to all angels as the sorrowful star be no longer blind millionaire whose millions have ministered to self without relieving sorrow for when the world is totally corrupt when self is dominant when cunning supersedes honesty when gold is man's chief ambition when purity is condemned when poets teach lewdness and scientists blasphemy when love is mocked and god forgotten the end is near i take my part in that end for the souls of mankind are not done with when they leave their fleshly tenements when this planet is destroyed as a bubble broken in the air the souls of men and women live on as the soul of the woman you loved lives on as the soul of the mother who bore her lives on i as all my worshippers live on through a myriad worlds a myriad phases till they learn to shape their destinies for heaven and i with them live on in many shapes in many ways when they return to god cleansed and perfect so shall i return but not till then he paused again and i heard a faint sighing sound everywhere as of wailing voices and the name arimanes was breathed suddenly upon the silence i started up listening every nerve strained arimanes or Rimenez. I gazed fearfully at him, always beautiful, his countenance was now sublime, and his eyes shone with a lustrous flame. "'You thought me friend,' he said. "'You should have known me foe, for every one who flatters a man for his virtues, or humours him in his vices, is that man's worst enemy, whether demon or angel. But you judged me a fitting comrade, hence I was bound to serve you.' i and my followers with me you had no perception to realize this you supreme sorcerer of the supernatural little did you think of the terrifying agencies that worked the wonders of your betrothal feast at willowsmere little did you dream that fiends prepared the costly banquet and poured out the luscious wine at this a smothered groan of horror escaped me i looked wildly round me 
longing to find some deep grave of oblivious rest wherein to fall ay he continued the festival was fitted to the time of the world to-day society gorging itself blind and senseless and attended by a retinue from hell my servants looked like men for truly there is little difference twixt man and devil twas a brave gathering england has never seen so strange a one in all her annals the sighing wailing cries increased in loudness my limbs shook under me and all power of thought was paralyzed in my brain he bent his piercing looks upon me with a new expression of infinite wonder pity and disdain what a grotesque creation you men have made of me he said as grotesque as your conception of god with what trifling human attributes you have endowed me know you not that the changeless yet ever-changing essence of immortal life can take a million million shapes and yet remain unalterably the same were i as hideous as your churches figure me could the eternal beauty with which all angels are endowed ever change to such loathsomeness as haunts mankind's distorted imaginations perchance it would be well for none would make of me their comrade and none would cherish me as friend as fits each separate human nature so seems my image for thus is my fate and punishment commanded yet even in this mask of man i wear men own me their superior think you not that when the supreme spirit of god wore that same mask on earth men did not know him for their master yea they did know and knowing murdered him as they ever strive to murder all divine things as soon as their divinity is recognized face to face i stood with him upon the mountain top and there fulfilled my vow of temptation worlds and kingdoms supremacies and powers what were they to the ruler of them all get thee hence satan said the golden sounding voice ah glorious behest happy respite for i reached the very gate of heaven that night and heard the angels sing his accents sank to an infinitely mournful cadence what have your teachers done with me and my eternal sorrows he went on have not they and the unthinking churches proclaimed a lie against me saying that i rejoice in evil o oh man to whom by god's will and because the world's end draws nigh i unveil a portion of the mystery of my doom learn now once and for all that there is no possible joy in evil it is the despair and the discord of the universe it is man's creation my torment god's sorrow every sin of every human being adds weight to my torture and length to my doom yet my oath against the world must be kept i have sworn to tempt to do my uttermost to destroy mankind but man has not sworn to yield to my tempting he is free let him resist and i depart let him accept me i remain eternal justice has spoken humanity through the teaching of god made human must work out its own redemption and mine here suddenly advancing he stretched out his hand his figure grew taller vaster and more majestic come with me now he said in a low penetrating voice that sounded sweet yet menacing come for the veil is down for you to-night you shall understand with whom you have dwelt so long in your shifting cloud castle of life and in what company you have sailed perilous seas one who proud and rebellious like you errs less in that he owns god as his master at these words a thundering crash assailed my ears all the windows on either side of the saloon flew open and showed a strange glitter as of steely spears pointed aloft to the moon then half fainting i felt myself grasped and lifted suddenly and forcibly upwards and in another moment found myself on the deck of the flame held fast as a prisoner in the fierce grip of hands invisible raising my eyes in deadly despair prepared for hellish tortures and with a horrible sense of conviction in my soul that it was too late to cry out to god for mercy i saw around me a frozen world 
a world that seemed as if the sun had never shone upon it. Thick, glassy green walls of ice pressed round the vessel on all sides, and shut her in between their inflexible barriers. Fantastic palaces, pinnacles, towers, bridges, and arches of ice formed in their architectural outlines and groupings the semblance of a great city. Over all the coldly glistening peaks, the round moon, emerald pale, looked down, and standing opposite to me against the mast, I beheld not Lucio, but an angel. End of chapter 40chapter 41 of the sorrows of satan by marie corelli this librivox recording is in the public domain crowned with a mystic radiance as of trembling stars of fire that sublime figure towered between me and the moonlit sky the face austerely grand and beautiful shone forth luminously pale the eyes were full of unquenchable pain unspeakable remorse, unimaginable despair. The features I had known so long, and seen day by day, in familiar intercourse, were the same. The same, yet transfigured with ethereal splendor, while shadowed by an everlasting sorrow. Bodily sensations I was scarcely conscious of. Only the soul of me, hitherto dormant, was awake and palpitating with fear. Gradually I became aware that others were around me, and looking, I saw a dense crowd of faces, wild and wonderful. Imploring eyes were turned upon me in piteous or stern agony, and pallid hands were stretched towards me more in appeal than menace. And I beheld as I gazed the air darkening, and anon lightning with a shadow and the brightness of wings. Vast pinions of crimson flame began to unfurl and spread upwards all round the ice-bound vessel, upwards till their glowing tips seemed well nigh to touch the moon, and he, my foe, who leaned against the mast, became likewise encircled with these shafted pinions of burning rose, which, like finely webbed clouds colored by a strong sunset, streamed outward flaringly from his dark form and sprang aloft in a blaze of scintillant glory. And a voice, infinitely sad, yet infinitely sweet, struck solemn music from the frozen silence. Steer onward, Emil, onward to the boundaries of the world. With every spiritual sense aroused, I glanced toward the steerman's wheel. Was that Emil, whom I had instinctively loathed, that being, stern as a figure of deadliest fate with sable wings and tortured countenance if so i knew him now for a fiend in very truth if burning horror and endless shame can so transfigure the soul of a man a history of crime was written in his anguished looks what secret torment racked him no living mortal might dare to guess with pallid skeleton hands he moved the wheel and as it turned, the walls of ice around us began to split with a noise of thunder. Onward, Emil, said the great sad voice again. Onward, where never man hath trod. Steer on to the world's end. The crowd of weird and terrible faces grew denser. The flaming and darkening of wings became thicker than driving storm clouds rent by lightning. Wailing cries, groans, and dreary sounds of sobbing echoed about me on all sides. Again the shattering ice roared like an earthquake under the waters. And, unhindered by her frozen prison walls, the ship moved on. Dizzily, and as one in a mad dream, I saw the great glittering bergs rock and bend forward. The massive ice city shook to its foundation glistening pinnacles dropped and vanished, towers lurched over, broke and plunged into the sea, huge mountains of ice split up like fine glass, yawning asunder with a green glare in the moonlight as the flame propelled, so it seemed, by the demon wings of her terrific crew, 
cut through the frozen passage with the sharpness of a sword and the swiftness of an arrow. Whither were we bound? I dared not think. I deemed myself dead. The world I saw was not the world I knew. I believed I was in some spirit land beyond the grave, whose secrets I should presently realize perchance too well. On, on we went, I keeping my strained sight fixed for the most part on the supreme shape that always confronted me, that angel foe whose eyes were wild with an eternity of sorrows. Face to face with such an immortal despair, I stood confounded and slain for ever in my own regard, a worthless atom, meriting naught but annihilation. The wailing cries and groans had ceased, and we sped on in an awful silence, while countless tragedies, unnameable histories, were urged upon me in the dumb eloquence of the dreary faces round me, and the expressive teaching of their terrific eyes. Soon the barriers of ice were passed, and the flame floated out beyond them into a warm inland sea, calm as a lake and bright as silver in the broad radiance of the moon. On either side were undulating shores, rich with lofty and luxuriant verdure. I saw the distant hazy outline of dusky purple hills. I heard the little waves plashing against hidden rocks and murmuring upon the sand. Delicious odors filled the air. A gentle breeze blew. Was this the lost paradise? this semi-tropic zone concealed behind a continent of ice and snow? Suddenly, from the tops of the dark branching trees, came floating the sound of a bird singing, and so sweet was the song, so heart-whole was the melody, that my aching eyes filled with tears. Beautiful memories rushed upon me, the value and graciousness of life, life on the kindly sunlit earth, seemed very dear to my soul. Life's opportunities, its joys, its wonders, its blessings, all showered down upon a thankless race by a loving creator. These appeared to me all at once as marvelous. Oh, for another chance of such life, to redeem the past, to gather up the wasted gems of lost moments, to live as a man should live, in accordance with the will of God, and in brotherhood with his fellow men. The unknown bird sang on in a cadence like that of a mavis in spring, only more tunefully. Surely no other woodland songster ever sang half so well. And, as its dulcet notes dropped roundly one by one upon the mystic silence, I saw a pale creature move out from amid the shadowing of black and scarlet wings, a white woman shape clothed in her own long hair. She glided up to the vessel's edge, and there she leaned, with anguished face upturned. It was the face of Sybil, and even while I looked upon her, she cast herself wildly down upon the deck and wept. My soul was stirred within me. I saw in very truth all that she might have been. I realized what an angel a little guiding love and patience might have made her. And at last, I pitied her. I never pitied her before. And now, many familiar faces shone upon me like white stars in a mist of rain, all faces of the dead, all marked with unquenchable remorse and sorrow. One figure passed before me drearily, in fetters glistening with a weight of gold. I knew him for my college friend of olden days. Another, crouching on the ground in fear, I recognized as him who had staked his last possession at play, even to his immortal soul. I even saw my father's face, worn and aghast with grief, and trembled lest the scared beauty of her who had died to give me birth should find a place among these direful horrors. But no, Thank God I never saw her. Her spirit had not lost its way to heaven. Again my eyes reverted to the mover of this mystic scene, that fallen splendor whose majestic shape now seemed to fill both earth and sky. A fiery glory blazed about him. He raised his hand, 
the ship stopped, and the dark steersman rested motionless on the wheel. Round us, the moonlit landscape was spread like a glittering dream of fairyland, and still the unknown bird of God sang on with such entrancing tenderness as must have soothed hell's tortured souls. Lo, here we pause, said the commanding voice. Here, where the distorted shape of man hath never cast a shadow. Here, where the arrogant mind of man hath never conceived a sin. Here, where the godless greed of man hath never defaced a beauty, or slain a woodland thing. Here, the last spot on earth left untainted by man's presence. Here is the world's end. When this land is found, and these shores profaned, when mammon plants its foot upon this soil, then dawns the judgment day. But until then, here, where only God doth work perfection, angels may look down undismayed, and even fiends find rest. A solemn sound of music surged upon the air, and I, who had been as one in chains, bound by invisible bonds and unable to stir, was suddenly liberated, fully conscious of freedom. I still faced the dark, gigantic figure of my foe, for his luminous eyes were now upon me, and his penetrating voice addressed me only. Man, deceive not thyself, he said. Think not the terrors of this night are the delusion of a dream, or the snare of a vision. Thou art awake, not sleeping. Thou art flesh as well as spirit. This place is neither hell nor heaven, nor any space between. It is a corner of thine own world on which thou livest. Wherefore know from henceforth that the supernatural universe in and around the natural is no lie, but the chief reality. Inasmuch as God surroundeth all, fate strikes thine hour, and in this hour tis given thee to choose thy master. Now, by the will of God, thou seest me as angel. But take heed thou forget not that among men I am as man. In human form, I move with all humanity through endless ages, to kings and counselors, to priests and scientists, to thinkers and teachers, to old and young. I come in the shape their pride or vice demands, and am as one with all. Self finds in me another ego, but from the pure in heart, the high in faith, the perfect in intention, I do retreat with joy, offering not save reverence, demanding naught, save prayer. So am I, so must I ever be, till man of his own will releases and redeems me. Mistake me not, but know me, and choose thy future for truth's sake, and not out of fear. Choose and change not in any time hereafter. This hour, this moment is thy last probation. Choose, I say, Wilt thou serve self, and me, or God only? The question seemed thundered on my ears. Shuddering, I looked from right to left, and saw a gathering crowd of faces, white, wistful, wondering, threatening, and imploring. They pressed about me close, with glistening eyes and lips that moved dumbly. And as they stared upon me, I beheld another spectral thing, the image of myself a poor, frail creature, pitiful, ignorant, and undiscerning, limited in both capacity and intelligence, yet full of strange egotism and still stranger arrogance. Every detail of my life was suddenly presented to me as in a magic mirror, and I read my own chronicle of paltry intellectual pride, vulgar ambition, and vulgarer ostentation. I realized with shame my miserable vices, my puny scorn of God, my effronteries and blasphemies, and in the sudden strong repulsion and repudiation of my own worthless existence, being, and character, I found both voice and speech. God only! I cried fervently. Annihilation at his hands! 
rather than life without him, God only. I have chosen. My words vibrated passionately on my own ears. And even as they were spoken, the air grew misty with a snowy, opalescent radiance. The sable and crimson wings uplifted in such multitudinous array around me, palpitated with a thousand changeful hues. And over the face of my dark foe, a light celestial fell like the smile of dawn. Awed and afraid, I gazed upward, and there I saw a new and yet more wondrous glory, a shining figure outlined against the sky in such surpassing beauty and vivid brilliancy as made me think the sun itself had risen in vast angel shape on rainbow pinions. And from the brightening heaven there rang a silver voice, clear as a clarion call, Arise, Lucifer, son of the morning, one soul rejects thee, one hour of joy is granted thee, hence and arise. Earth, air, and sea blazed suddenly into fiery gold. Blinded and stunned, I was seized by compelling hands, and held firmly down by a force invisible. The yacht was slowly sinking under me, overwhelmed with unearthly terrors, my lips yet murmured, God, God only! The heavens changed from gold to crimson, anon to shining blue, and against this mass of wavering color that seemed to make a jeweled archway of the sky, I saw the form of him whom I had known as man swiftly ascend, godlike, with flaming pinions and upturned glorious visage, like a vision of light in darkness. Around him clustered a million winged shapes, but he, supreme, majestic, wonderful, towered high above them all, a very king of splendor, the glory round his brows resembling meteor fires in an arctic midnight, his eyes, twin stars, ablaze with such great rapture as seemed half agony. Breathless and giddy, I strained my sight to follow him as he fled, and heard the musical calling of strange, sweet voices everywhere, from east to west, from north to south. Lucifer, beloved and unforgotten, Lucifer, son of the morning, arise, arise. With all my remaining strength, I strove to watch the vanishing upward of that sublime luminance that now filled the visible universe. The demon ship was still sinking steadily. Invisible hands still held me down. I was falling, falling into unimaginable depths, when another voice, till then unheard, solemn yet sweet, spoke aloud. Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outermost darkness of the world. There let him find my light. I heard, yet felt no fear. God only! I said, as I sank into the vast profound, and lo, while the words yet trembled on my lips, I saw the sun, the sweet earth sun, the kindly orb familiar, the lamp of God's protection, its golden rim came glittering upwards in the east, higher and higher it rose, making a shining background for that mighty figure, whose darkly luminous wings now seemed like sable storm clouds stretched wide across the horizon. Once more, yet once, the angel visage bent its warning looks on me. I saw the anguished smile, the great eyes burning with immortal sorrows. Then I was plunged forcibly downwards and thrust into an abysmal grave of frozen cold. End of chapter 41